Hi, I am Giselle Salvador. I am an art educator, an educational psychology student, and a television and film production manager. Today, I will be sharing with you some insights, learnings, and practices that I do to encourage creative production in the virtual classroom. Let me begin by asking, have you wondered what happens inside the mind of your students? Is it only me or similarly, this is a resonating question to you? Well, I think as an educator, facilitator, formator, it is quite ordinary when we want to know what's inside the minds of our students. What are they thinking? What are they feeling? Because being aware of their situation, their feelings, their disposition helps us as teachers to do or to manage the intentions that we have for our class. Speaking about intentions, I remember a write-up by my thesis advisor, one of my favorite teachers. She wrote about an article. She, she wrote an article sharing about a talk given by John Maxwell in Manila back in 2015. Now, she wrote about intentionality. She quoted, anything valuable is intentional. Good intentions are not enough. Further, she wrote, people will not reach their potential unless they become intentional in their lives. Intentional living is not only just writing down the goals and achieving them, but understanding why these goals are there in the first place. So as teachers, we are encouraged not just to know how we can teach the subject, not just how to create wonderful lesson plans. We are encouraged to understand why we have these plans in the first place. Personally, these questions are questions that I ask myself. Okay, I'm moving so that you can see it. <laughs> when I am creating my lesson, when I'm designing my students' lessons, how can I encourage artistic creativity or how do I harness what's already there? And how can I motivate them to, to do the task? They say that teachers are not people who knows what, they, they know how, and they know why. But most importantly, they are people who cares why. It's like, we know our subject very well, and we know how to teach it. We know what our students are like and how they learn. That's already an extra. Knowing why is part of our work also. Why the why this student was late? Why was why was he absent? Why can't he draw? Why why is he not drawing? And then we learn that oh, because he's shy or and somehow. But it does not stop there, right? We care about that and we do something about that. When we know why he was absent, we, we realize that, oh, he was sick. And then from there on, we do other steps to help our student. And me, as an art educator, I care about the student's artistic creativity. Um, I, I know I know I have an idea what artistic creativity is. I somehow know how this happens, but I really care what I can do about it as a teacher. And that's why my thesis is about the artistic creative thinking process of students. My students are students. Students who are living and learning differently from how we lived or learned, or at least how I learned from before. I want to share with you my proposed framework. 
So my proposed framework shows the different stages of the artistic creative process of students and the different factors that influences these stages. Now, I learned from my thesis that, yes, there are different factors that may influence how a student creates his or her work. But a very valuable discovery that I had is how a teacher may transform these influences and then may influence how he works, meaning it may motivate him more to do his work or it may make him not like creating anymore. Going back to the first question I mentioned earlier, how do we encourage artistic creativity or harness what is already there? When I was doing the thesis, I was thinking about it. And then I learned that by understanding what influences this, this process of creating, we might encourage them or we might encourage the artistic creativity or what, what, what already is there in our students. I'll be sharing with you these influences and then I'll be sharing with you how I try to transform these influences to help encourage artistic creativity in the classroom. First is domain relevant skills. So domain relevant skills are the knowledge about the domain. Domain meaning, for example, in our case, it's art. So his or her knowledge in art, the technical skills. Uh, so these are the things that he or she have learned so far. This also includes the talent of a student. So we know that, for example, in art, there are students who are really, really good in art artistically because they are talented. Some of them um, came from a family of artists and this fact actually adds to the domain relevant skills of a student. So whatever experiences he or she may have and formal and informal education on the domain, so in our case, in art, adds to domain relevant skills. That's why our students have different levels of knowledge and skills in a subject because they have different domain relevant skills. Well, in a way, if they get in from one school, somehow their formal education about the domain is not so far from each other. Now, creativity relevant processes is about the style of the student. Now this becomes more personal. This is how he or she creates his idea. And now this depends on, was he trained to do this? Was he allowed to do this? So you see, we have students who are afraid of saying their opinion because they're not used to it. And there are some who are very outspoken. In the same way in creativity, we have students who are not afraid to create even if they make mistakes, even if they make not so nice drawings. And we have students who are very careful because they don't want to make mistakes. And it is part of creativity relevant processes. These teachers, do we train them to be more creative? Do we allow them to have an open mind? Do we train them to have different perspectives? Do we allow them to make mistakes and learn from it? Now, how do my knowledge of the domain relevant skills and the creativity relevant processes, how do I use that knowledge when I teach? Since I'm a teacher who does not only you know, like what I said earlier, no, I, I care. 
I usually really get to know my students um, in, a, in a way that I can. And in that way, I somehow, well, one thing that, of course, is very important is that we, we can ask the previous teacher. In my case, um, I ask the previous school year's teacher of what they have learned. This is what they know. This is what they did. So somehow, I know what they have experienced generally. So I know what they have, their domain relevant skills generally. So from there, I pick it up. And that's why the, our curriculum is also like that spiral, right? We, get, we pick it up from where they come from. But how do I make it or how do I do it in my subject? Me, I design personally their learning materials. How do I do it or what do I mean? Um, I, I, I think most of us create our own presentations. I, I do that, but I also do all the video presentations, um, the the modules or the PDF formats, um, and I think a lot of teachers do that because getting it from Steve Jobs, designing is not only how cool it will look like. Um, designing is not just oh this this is a nice color. Designing is how it works, and and as a teacher knowing or having an idea about their domain relevant skills and their creative processes, I want these learning materials to support whatever they have so that they can be more creative. Now, I discovered um, this bandwidth immediacy matrix by Daniel Stanford in 2020. Now, um, let me clarify first that bandwidth is not the speed of the internet. Bandwidth is how much you receive in, in, in a period of time. So, for example, we have, imagine you have a pail of water and you have a glass. Now, when you're pouring water, the flow of water is the speed. But the amount of water being poured to is the bandwidth. So it is important. So when we're talking about having materials and we talk about bandwidth, it's not just, oh, if you have fast internet, ideally it's better if you have high bandwidth. Now, these matrix offers different situations that may help us in creating or in delivering projects for our students. So, so what do I mean? Let me go. Um, more specifically, the green zone, the low immediacy and low bandwidth zone. So this is a zone that shows materials that you can use if your internet or your bandwidth is low and that the project or the activity that you're creating is not immediate or is not needed right away. So these are things that you can use. I, I, I think you're familiar with these apps. Um, we I think since the pandemic started, most of us were used to sending emails more often than before. Um, in a way, we can also use Padlet. It's an app where you can discuss things and even attach images. Also, we don't we don't get away with our readings. Um, we can still get journals, download them, and then send them to our students as samples, and then send to email also. Now, the blue zone is the zone of Im high immediacy and low bandwidth. So this is when you have low bandwidth, but you need a respond right away. We need, I need your reply or your project right away. So here, um, I suggest that you can do like, um, if, I think you're familiar with the uh, Google Docs, uh, Google Sheets, and even Google Presentations where you can collaborate. Um, even if you're not together, uh, you can create one presentation. You can create 
um, you can have take notes of your meetings together. I think a lot of parents also use Viber and Facebook Messenger or, or other messaging uh, applications to get information from teachers. I think most especially when they're doing the modules and they need response right away. So you do this group chat and messaging. Now, the yellow zone. The yellow zone shows high bandwidth, but low immediacy. So this is when, again, the, the material is not needed right away. And then you have enough bandwidth to do so, to, 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 to send it and to receive it. Now, I may, I may sound like having high bandwidth is having, having materials that needs high bandwidth is something that we should not do because, you know, not everyone has high bandwidth. No, also, because this depends on your, again, purpose or your intention. Why are you using this? Now, materials with high bandwidth usually are high because they have videos and audios, which most of the time are better when it comes to children. So that's enough reason why we choose to use some of these tools also. So now, um, these tools you can use for sending videos, uh, recorded videos, uh, recorded materials for your students. Um, now, these platforms I'm sharing with you, like the uh, CISO and Schoology are LMS. So they are learning management systems. Um, they can also be used in low bandwidth because you can also send just images or just texts using these apps. Okay, but these apps you can also use if you want to send video materials, which are high band, high in bandwidth. The next zone is the red zone. Now the red zone has high immediacy and high bandwidth. I think most of us are very familiar with different video conferences already because when we had our online classes, most of us used these platforms to have live so um, classes. Well, we call them synchronous. So when we do synchronous classes, we, we get to see our students. Um, we get to get their reactions right away. They get to ask us and we can respond right away. They can also somehow feel what what we want them to feel, if you want to be playful or want to be serious or we, we want to teach them values um, compared to text images or modules that, had, that do not really speak or they really can't hear your voice. So this is one advantage of having high bandwidth. Now, what I'm saying, I, I'd like to clarify. Let me go back to the... Here, I'd like to clarify that there is no better zone. I am sharing with you these zones because these are options that we can use so that we can deliver our lessons and our learning materials better. Plus the fact that we can do this with intentionality knowing where our students are, knowing what we can do, we can choose from all these zones. Personally, what I try to do, if I can, I try to create materials that fits all of the zones. For example, I teach them how to do drawing. I send a PDF material. I send a video material. I send... Um, materials with drawings, uh, how-to steps, and I do also do it synchronously. So that in whatever situation my student might be, somehow I know that they can catch up. 
So like when I do synchronous teaching, I know that not everyone can follow the steps right away since not everyone really are very good at drawing. So I send them materials which they can open and follow even after the synchronous class. And if they don't have high bandwidth, they can just do the PDF formats, which has the drawings, the drawing images, sample images, and texts that tells them what to do. So um, again, there's no better zone. Uh, these are zones that probably zones of your students. And now you know what you can do depending on how immediate the work is and depending on how or how much their bandwidth is. Okay, let me forward to. Okay. So how do, since I told you that I'm creating the materials, how do I create them? Uh, I, create the, I, I do the print materials or the PDF formats that I mentioned earlier. I use Keynote, Canva, I, Word or Pages, or I, I, I look up to journals and search for some which are connected to what I want to share with them and then I send it to them. In Canva, you can design your own work. I think some of you are familiar with it also. If not, you can do searching later on, search Canva. Um, you can design. They have already uh, pre-made designs there. You can just improve or you can just change the texts. And then you can print them in PDF. You can print them as image. So I also use Canva for creating videos. Um, Keynote also and PowerPoint. You can actually, when you create, uh, when you save your file, there's an option where you can create it as a movie. So sometimes um, I design it using Canva with, with pre-made suggestions already, which is easier and time efficient. And then I put them together in Keynote so that I can put more text if I want to or notes if I want to. And then I edit the movie in iMovie so I can add um, songs if I want to. Um, I, I got an idea from a colleague. Uh, another thing that she does is she send presentation materials using PowerPoint, including the notes. So, which is very helpful for some students who missed your class and has low bandwidth. Um, in that case, in a way, she has the visuals already and then she has in the notes part what you said in the class. Okay. Um, for the presentations, I, I use the same things. I put here Zoom features because um, I use Zoom also when doing presentations. I allow them to... Uh, draw there sometimes. I even allow them to do screen sharing. Uh, so uh, digital medias are video materials that I can also get from uh, professional colleagues or from educational websites, uh, which are really very helpful when we're teaching and we want to show them demos. Now, um, here sharing with you how I try to, to, to encourage them. Of course, especially during online setups, you're thinking, how do our teachers encourage students to draw when they're online? Like, you can't even motivate, how do you even motivate them? That, oh, your drawing is nice because, you know, when we're face to face, we can do it together and then we can do comments. So, here are the things that I can, I try to do. Now, the use of new media technology is another factor that I discovered in this, in my thesis. In the same way, um, this is actually the focus of my study. Like, uh, how is the use of new media present in the creative process of the students? Now, the use of new media technology, uh, new media technology includes uh, the, the, the digital devices and services. So these are our tablets, our iPads, our desktops, our laptops, the internet, the websites, the platforms that we use, the tools, the apps that we use. So all of it, all together, we call it new media technology. Now, 
the use of new media technology influences the creative process one specifically the functions of these tools and services now instrumentality guarantees that the creative production is performed properly so am i using the right tool to help them draw really or because it's just fun well if your intention is just to make it fun that's fine but if your intention is you want to teach them then you should choose the tool or the app that helps them how to draw now adaptability is um it's is, is, is this tool okay for grade two students or it's already for grade seven students? It's not like, oh, I saw in, in, in a webinar, they use this app for, uh, and then you have, you were amazed by it. But after that, you should study the functions of this app and how will your students navigate this app? So will this be helpful? Again, going back to your intentions, good intentions are not enough. We should understand why we're doing it and then we should, um, and these technologies should support that intention. Now, this one, this is also a valuable discovery. Um, in my study, uh, I learned the meaning of new media technology with, with my students. Um, my participants were high school students, and then they shared with me how they get inspiration from the internet or from different apps, from different tools. They also discovered that most of them combine traditional and digital tools. And depends. Like meaning means um, the the meaning of the of the tool to them. I have a student who likes drawing with paper and pencil. Until the day that his parents gifted him a drawing tablet, and that it became so meaningful to him that he started creating a lot of digital artworks. And these artworks are really very nice. I, I have a student also, uh, one participant also was, um, he specifically likes building, I mean, drawing buildings. And then later on, I discovered, oh, he came from a family of architects and that he is inspired and influenced by his dad. And the tools that he used is also because of the influence of, and that's the meaning of new media technology. Now, having the idea of, knowing the function and the meaning of new media technology. Knowing this, um, I try to find the best app that, that, that gives the proper function of, of my intention. But at the same time, um, at least in our case, I allow them to use other tools, which makes them feel more confident which makes them feel inspired in creating. Because, you know, some of these tools are, if, if, you're, if you've been watching webinars, you'll say, I, I've already seen something like this, or I've used this tool already, and oh, I, I can just use it. They're, they're all almost the same. Probably some functions are the same. That there's, and that's where meaning comes in also. Um, they have different interface uh, and they have different experiences in this. So it is important that we don't just look at the use of the tool, but also the experience in the tool. Now, connecting it to that, one important thing that I remember when I create my materials is art connection. So when I teach my students figure drawing, I, I taught them the basics, how to measure, what is proportion, how to use the ruler. But I allowed them to, okay, you're allowed to make it personal. You can create it in your own designs, different positions. 
some of them even added elements like a bird here or made a story already. And in our production, I, I used traditional and digital technology and allow them to choose whether they'd want to use both, they just want, they just want to use one. I, I, I teach them figure drawing, different positions, and then some of them I ask to take a video here of their work. So using the video of their camera, they do flip, flipping of their drawings. I taught them how to animate using Keynote um, and PowerPoint, Keynote and PowerPoint. So uh, we put together in different slides and then you can actually file and save it into a movie. It becomes an animation already. Some of my students were even extra. Uh, using iMovie, the green screen of iMovie, um, we put together their paintings this time and their animated drawings. So you see, um, they, they, they put together all their learnings and then they, they, they have the freedom to do it. So um, using technology and traditional, the drawings were made in papers. First, they took a photo of it and then they put it in a digital platform. Art appreciation, uh, using our LMS Seesaw, I allow my students to post their drawings and their creations, and then they are allowed to like and comment on their classmates' work. Um, I also allow them, you can see here in Zoom, uh, they can share their works and how they do it. I put them on spotlight video and allow them to share screen their work. Again, I'd like to end um, this presentation going back to remember your intentions. And if they are good, that's good. But it's not good enough. The intentions should be something that will bring our students to where they want to be. And we put these intentions in the beginning already because what we do next, the next things that we do will depend on it. It's, that's why it's very important we become aware to their situations. Uh, we care about their wise. Um, I think that's almost my last slide. Yes, thank you. Um, I hope I, am a, I was able to share with you um, insights that you needed to hear, uh, platforms that you would like to research. Um, please know that uh, we are reachable. Um, we are very, very willing to share with you what we do in our class and how we use the tools. So please stay connected and um, continue um, reaching out to us. Thank you.